Okay, um, our, our study tonight, our text tonight is Matthew 6, uh, verses 1 through 16. Matthew 6, verses 1 through 16. Give you a few minutes to kind of peruse that and see uh, see what that what that says uh, for you. Then we're gonna then we're gonna uh, uh, put a little different spin on 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 what we look at. But first of all, I want you to get your 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 first uh, observations of the text and things that seem to step, to jump out at you, and uh, and, and then we're gonna uh, kind of look at that text in a broader sense. I guess you. Al, if you can if you can stick around just to, for a few minutes, I got some signatures I need from uh, afterward. I appreciate it. Thank you. So let's just uh, why don't we read? We'll read through our text. Uh, 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 make sure you have your notes for your observations for this, uh, and then we're gonna then we're gonna uh, take a a second look at our text, but uh, uh, in, in a little different way. Uh, so it starts at verse number one. It says, Take heed that you do not do your charitable deeds before men to be seen by them. Otherwise you have no reward from your Father in heaven. Therefore, when you do a charitable deed, do not sound a trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may have glory from men. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. But when you do a charitable, charitable deed, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. That your charitable deed may be in secret, and that your Father who sees in secret will himself reward you openly. And when you pray, you shall not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the corner of the streets, that they may be seen by men. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. 
But you, when you pray, go into your room, and when you shut your door, pray to your Father who is in the secret place, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. And when you pray, do not use vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Therefore, do not be like them, for your Father knows the things you have need of before you ask of him. In this manner, therefore, pray, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us of our debts as we forgive our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Moreover, when you fast, do not be like the hypocrites with a sad countenance, for they disfigure their faces that they may appear to, to men to be fasting. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. They have their reward. Any quick observations that, you, that you've seen as you look to this, it jumps out. Do not brag. Do not brag. That's right. That's right. That, that, that's right. Uh, 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 and and as, you'll, as you'll see when we jump into that, that's something, that's something that Jesus emphasizes quite a bit. Yes. Quite a bit. Yes. Um, I think it's interesting that he keeps emphasizing how you know, God sees in secret. I think it's kind of cool because it's really leaning on the, the way the new covenant is that we have the Holy Spirit with us and we have that really close, you know, in a way secret connection, you know. Mm. Yes, yes. The, that, the involvement of the Holy Spirit. That that's 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 involved in, in the entire process. Any other observations that you saw when we looked at this teaching? Yes, sir. When he talks a lot about rewards, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. being, uh, I don't know, being justified or being rewarded, I guess I could say. For, you know, for what you do. And I think what he's trying to tell us here is there's a right way and a wrong way to get rewards from God. Mm -hmm. and, and if you go the wrong way, you simply are not going to get it. Uh, yet, yet he does, he's, he, he, it's funny, it seems that the, that, that he, uh, and, 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 and correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems like in the text that when he uses the word reward, he is oftentimes using it in the context of them. They have their reward. You know, the, the ones that are doing it wrong. Uh, so, so, uh, 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 which could suggest that we have a different system of, uh, <laughs> of functioning and operating, which is grace. Uh, yes? Well, another thing, it, it, it also suggests that uh, what you do here will be rewarded later if mm -hmm. you don't abuse it here. Yes, yes, absolutely. <clears throat> absolutely. As a matter of fact, the, 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 the great bar judgment is a judgment of reward. Reward does have a place in the word in the word of God. Remember they said we'll have a crown crown. We'll be given crowns of righteousness. We'll be given uh, uh, you know if we if we persevere and all the all these things. So yes it, it does play into uh, uh, into uh, uh, but even that we throw back at the feet of Jesus, <laughs> you know, because we realize that it wasn't us at all. <laughs> well, I um, said, you know, I noticed that the motives of what you do yeah. is just as important as the fact of doing it. That's, that's, that's right. Mm -hmm. and that's, that's, that's going to be, that's, that'll be a key factor uh, uh, tonight. That'll, go, that'll play right along with what Eric said about, about uh, boasting and, 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 and bragging. In, 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 in. When he gave us the Lord's Prayer, I did a study several many years ago. Um, there's some translations that, and that when it in the original Aramaic, when it talks about deliver us from the evil one, it mm -hmm. is like an exclamation mark in the original grammatical. That it's very important, and it, it, how it is. I mean, I can remember. 
thought about this when we did this study. It's like, how many of us said that, always said the Lord's Prayer, deliver us from evil? Mm -hmm. And a lot of times they left evil one off. And it was, Jesus was very emphatic when he gave this prayer. Mm -hmm. He, you know, he, you read into it, I guess, so to speak. He was very emphatic. This is how we need to pray. If you base all your prayers based how he delivers this one, every one of your prayers will be heard. Yeah, yes, and I, and, I, I, and I really believe that's, that, that's the huge intent of that. Of that. Mm -hmm. it, was a, it was a pattern for us to, uh, uh, to, to pray by. As a matter of fact, one of my favorite books I read years ago was Can You Tarry But One Hour? And the person, the, the person that taught it basically taught you how to pray for an hour or more just using, just using uh, the Lord's Prayer as a, as a foundation. And it was easy. it's quite easy. Uh, to do that, so if you want to experience extended prayer, uh, 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 that's a great that's a great uh, way to, to do it. Any other? Well, let's let's try let's try something just a little just a little different this morning. This morning, we can go around that. We're going to be looking at spiritual disciplines. Uh, uh, tonight, as, as a matter as a matter of fact, uh, we're going to be looking at spiritual disciplines Jesus's way uh, as as we look at as we look at these things. So I want you to look at this text again, but I want you to resist the impulse to make these three things topics. Okay, that we delve into. These three things are actual spiritual disciplines. Uh, you know, can somebody give me a quick definition of what spiritual discipline means? What a spiritual discipline is? Yes, James. I always kind of saw it as building a habit that's related to spiritual action or thing. That's, that, that's right. And usually it involves pushing down our fleshly desires or tendencies. Like yes. It's inconvenient or whatever. So Phrase I like to, to, to use is, is holy habits because it's habits that 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 that, that helps shape shape us. Anybody else, anybody else? Uh, uh, what do you think about when you think about of uh, spiritual disciplines? I guess it'd be like a habit. It, it, it's automatic. Oh, it becomes it's something. It becomes. That, yeah. It just becomes part of your, it really your daily um, routine. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, a good good way to. Uh, it becomes routine in our life. I believe that's, I believe that's the intention of, of spiritual disciplines, is that for it to become, move from being something that we're resistant against until something that we, becomes more and more uh, the, the, uh, the, uh, the, the norm as the Holy Spirit begins to shape us in the image of Christ. Yes, Ron? Um, I think they're not optional. But that's a good point. That's a good point. That's, that's right. Too, too many people, uh, too many people believe discipleship's optional. You know, that, as if that's just something that, that you know you do if you just if you don't have anything if you don't have anything to do. But it's uh, it was it's the will of God. So that means, you know, uh, that, that we're here for, for, for that very purpose. I like that because it does. I didn't really think about that, but it does say it says when you fast, mm -hmm. when you pray, you know, when you give. Exactly, exactly. It's also, and, it's a, and another thing that, that I want you to realize, that it, it, it is a tool. Spiritual disciplines is God-given tools that he has given to us to, to change, to be transformed. Tools that the Holy Spirit uses in our lives to, to, to make us into the image of God more and more. It, it, is, it, is, it, is, it is our intentional endeavor to obedience. It's our intentional endeavor to be who God says we are. It's our intentional endeavor to move forward in that place. But we need to realize something. It is a tool. I believe too many people may, uh, uh, raise these, raise spiritual discipline on the level which, which is beyond a tool. They begin to you know, glorify uh, this thing that they do or that thing that they do where, where God intended it to be a tool to change us and to transform us. It's kind of like a hammer bragging how he built a house. 
He did not build the house. You know, he was in the hand of the carpenter that built the house. So in, in much the same way, uh, that, that's, that's the case. God is the focus of spiritual that, That's right. It's God, it's, God, it's, it's God empowered. So I'm, what I'd like you to do is take a look at this text again. But instead of seeing these as three topics, I want you to see them as one subject, and that is spiritual disciplines. And I want you to see the similarities. Jesus intentionally used words. It, he grouped these three things together. He intentionally said things. If you notice the repetition throughout the thing, that, that, that made this a one a topic, I guess you could say. So look at those things that he said that is common between uh, the, the three things that he's talking about there and see if you can see if you can determine what those three things are. Or not three things, there's, there's far more than that, but see if you can determine what the, some of those common ground is. Uh, and I believe in see, by seeing that, we'll see how Jesus saw spiritual discipline and, and how it should function and operate in our lives. Some of you have already, already mentioned some of it. Uh, Michelle mentioned that, that in, in all three instances, he said, when you do, the, do these things. Was that right? Rhonda did that, I'm sorry. Yeah. Any other similarities that you see in these, in these spiritual uh, gifts that Jesus addressed on one of them, then turn around and address on another one? Yes, James. Um, I wrote down do them with a humble heart, with no strings attached, and do them to please God, not ourselves, when you get a good reputation. Yes, good, 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 good point. Uh, and and we and, and and that's that is that's that's dead on. That's dead on. As, as you will see, as we delve into this with these observations about about what what God's God's word uh, has to say about these spiritual disciplines. So somebody tell somebody tell me um, um, what is the context of the this this scripture? What is the event that this teaching rose out of? Anybody know? The sermon. This was the Sermon on the Mount. This is right in the middle of the Sermon on the Mount. Now most scholars would tell you that they see the Sermon on the Mount as the Magna Carta of the Kingdom of God. That it is, is Jesus declaring to his disciples, and by the way, uh, Acts 5, I believe it's Acts, Acts 5, I mean not Acts, Matthew 5 and 1, it, it outlines that these words were spoken to his disciples. There's not a whole lot of salvation talk here, but there's a lot of talk about how we function, how we operate, how we see life, how we view each other. It, it's the equivalent. You see, he, he's outlining the kingdom culture. He's outlined, it's the equivalent of if you sit down with a missionary and they try to tell you what home is like. They try to tell you what the people there is like. Jesus is outlining for us how our attitudes, our outlooks, our faith, uh, our belief system, our, our practices, all these things is going to be laid out in, 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 the, in, the, in the kingdom of God. And he begins to, he begins to reveal to that. And one of the major topics in the entirety of the Sermon on the Mount is is this matter of righteousness of the kingdom of God. And one of the big differences and distinctions that he outlines for us about the righteousness of the kingdom of God, his kingdom, is where it comes from. You see, it, to, to, to the religious and to those that was, to, those that was around them, their righteousness was from what they did. Their righteousness was from all the great things that they did. But Jesus taught about a righteousness that comes from within us you see he, he was saying he was he was making the distinction that for the children of God for the for the citizens of the kingdom of God we don't we are not righteous because we do righteous things we do righteous things because we're righteous 
<laughs> that we aren't good because we do good things, but we do good things because we are good. We're not kind because we do kind things, but we, uh, we do kind things because we are kind. Because of the work that God is doing within us, an inward righteousness that rises up within us, an inward righteousness that, that has its source there. Now, this is not something that just Jesus just uh, uh, came up with. Jeremiah, uh, in, in, the word, in, the, in, the, in the word of God, prophesied that this would be the case in the new covenant. Notice what he said. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, says the Lord, I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. And I will be their God and they shall be my people. He talked about a righteousness that was written on their, in their minds and in their hearts that they respond to, that they react to. And as I, as I looked at this, I, I'm, like, I'm like, yes, that's it. That's the new covenant way of, of righteousness in our life. That we, as we're changed and transformed as disciples of Jesus Christ, we act differently. We live differently. We live by a different code. We live by a different worldview in our life because of the work that God is doing in us. So as a matter of fact, it shook the people to the core when Jesus said in Matthew 5 and 20, and this was in the, in, uh, also in, in, in the uh, Sermon on the Mount, he said, for I say to you that unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. That shook them to the core because here was the people that were living the letter of the law. Here was the people that were most, the most stringent, the most strict, but Jesus said, no, your righteousness will exceed their righteousness. Why? Because your righteousness isn't superficial. Your righteousness is real. Your righteousness is my righteousness put upon you that you begin to, to become, become more and more familiarized with and you live in that righteousness through, through obedience in Jesus Christ. So let's take, let's, let's take this text, if, if you will, that's, uh, that's, that's written in the sermon, that was uh, spoken on the Sermon on the Mount. Let's take the, the, the vantage point that it is spiritual disciplines in our lives that the Holy Spirit is working in our life. And let's make a few observations about how Jesus sees spiritual discipline. Uh, let's, let's do that uh, this morning. First of all, spiritual disciplines matter to Jesus. They matter to Jesus. That, 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 well, let, let me give you the quote. I, I realize there's a quote in, in there that I, for, I, I forgot to give you. And that's by Judson Cornwall. Judson Cornwall said this. Uh, he said, in all his teaching... Jesus seems to emphasize that God was more interested in getting heaven into us than giving, getting us into heaven. If you look at the teachings of Jesus Christ, his, his, his major concern seems to be the work of God in us, the work of God among us. So, so that seems to be his emphasis. But first of all, I want you to realize that spiritual disciplines matter to Jesus. Throughout the, the Gospels, we see Jesus cornered by people that wanted him to answer things that he didn't want to answer. They wanted to push him into a corner over some subject or over, and, and almost every time uh, Jesus does what I call a mic drop moment, where he says something profound and, and then he just moves on. He says something that silences them and then he just moves on. So when Jesus spends significant amount of time talking about anything, pay attention. Because that is important to Jesus. Jesus didn't have to teach these things. Jesus didn't have to, uh, uh, to expound on these things. But on the Sermon on the Mount, when I, he knew throughout history what that sermon would mean to the church and the body of Christ, when he begins to focus in on spiritual disciplines, it's because spiritual disciplines matter to Jesus Christ. It wasn't just a Jewish practice. It wasn't just a religious ritual. To Jesus, these disciplines had significance, and he wanted it to have significance through the entirety of the church. Yes? Well, before he came uh, to minister and establish his kingdom, these things never existed. Mm -hmm. the, the Pharisees never practiced them. They they well, prayed. Maybe, maybe, uh, they, 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 they they fasted and they and they well, and they. Well, I mean, they, maybe some of them they did, but but the, the real meat of his gospel. Oh, they, well, that's they, right. They, they passed by the wayside. Uh, yeah, that, that's right. They <clears throat> they functioned in it, mm -hmm. but they didn't 
grasp what it really, what it really meant. They didn't, never took it to heart. It never got below the surface of their life. The, Jesus understood that these things and a lot of other things. I got, a, I got an entire book here on the disciplines of a godly man. And it's filled with disciplines throughout the word of God. That's, the intention of it is to shape us into the image of Jesus Christ. The intention of it is, to, is for us to open ourselves up for more of him. And, and these, are, these are tools that God wants to do. They were, they were vitally important to Jesus Christ. They were vitally important to him. You see, Jesus wants these patterns to be a normal part of our lives. Uh, Ronnie pointed out, in each of these three instances, he made the bold statement, when you do this, when you give, when you pray, when you fast, he intended it to be a practice that we take with us. He intended it to be a practice that we, that we if we're going to live as disciples that are pleasing to our master, these, these, these practices should be a part of our lives. These practices should be because God knows what they will do for us and, and through us. But let me but be warned. He said there were people that were practicing these already that weren't doing what they should do. He called them hypocrites. Each time he says, when you do this, when you do this, when you do this. And then each time he says, but don't do it like they do it. <laughs> don't or, do it like the hypocrites. Or do, don't do it with the... Uh sense in your heart that you're doing it with some sense in their heart. Exactly, exactly. Another thing that I just caught this is, once again, when Jesus, to get everybody's attention in verse one, take heed. That, yes. It's like, it's like when your dad, pay attention. This is what I'm gonna share with you right, right now is pretty important. You know, and not just, oh, here, I wanna share this with you. That's right, that's right. Take heed. This is important. This was yes. important enough that when he had his disciples, and can I tell you, this wasn't just the 12 disciples. This word disciples meant all of those that, were, that, were, that had chosen to follow him. All of them that, that was a part of his, the wider scope of disciples that, that he spoke to on the, on the Sermon on the Mount. He wanted to instill in them the importance, the vital importance of what it meant to practice these spiritual disciplines. Now, not only did he teach them that, he practiced these things. If we truly believe that as disciples we are to mimic Jesus Christ, that means we've got to mimic Jesus Christ. That means we need to apply them to our lives and our hearts. It, there's no doubt in our mind how important, how vitally important prayer was to Jesus Christ. As a matter of fact, Luke uh, 6, 12 said, uh, said these words, and then he continued in prayer all night. You can look through the Word of God and see just how vitally important prayer was to him. How vitally important it was for him to spend time with the Father. How vitally important for him to expend. And Jesus didn't, prayer for him wasn't a, now I lay me down to sleep. Prayer for him was communion with the Father. I, I like one quote I read uh, 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 yesterday. It's, it, it read like this. One writer said, prayer was as fundamental an element in the life of Jesus as breathing. He inhaled his father's presence so he could exhale his father's will. That was the pattern for us. And I can't understand why Christians believe if it was that important for Jesus, why it shouldn't be that important for us. You know, if it was that important that he put those into practice and he had a disciplined prayer, prayer is life. Uh, why it's not imp vitally important for us to have a prayer life that, that way. Jesus lived that way. He fasted. Uh, he started his ministry by fasting for 40 days in the wilderness. Fasting was a part of it. He gave. Uh, he, he, had, he had nothing by the, by the, basically by the end of his ministry. The only, they had to part his, his cloak. That was all he, and that's all he had. Everything else he had shared and he'd given to every, everyone else. And I believe there was given that, that we're not even aware of. How do you know he gave like that? If he didn't, the Jews would have ripped him apart for it. Because it was that vitally important, a token of one's righteousness in the Gospels is how you gave to the poor. And if Jesus did not give to the poor, the Pharisees and the Sadducees would have had a, a so, but they never mentioned his lack of giving because I believe he, he, was, he was a gift. It was a normal part of his life. So we need to, we need to realize that spiritual matters, the spiritual disciplines matter to God. Also, motives matter to Jesus. 
Motives matter to Jesus. This is where this is where Eric's and uh, uh, and, and Michelle's uh, uh, comes into play. That Jesus always uh, addressed not just the practice but the why behind the practice. He said there's a lot of people doing this, but a lot of people are doing it for the wrong reasons. And he said he said if you do it for the wrong reason. It's not going to reward you like it. What he, I, I like him, I, believe, I wasn't here, but in another place, he said, he said, the, you know, uh, talking about them having their reward, uh, he, he alluded it to the fact that the applause and the attention of people was already their reward. They already had their reward because that's what they wanted and that's what they saw. So we can do the right things, but if we do it for the wrong reasons, it negates it. If we are praying so that we can talk to people about how much I pray, you're doing it for the wrong reason. If we're giving so that people can stand on the sideline and applause us, we're giving for the wrong reasons. Jesus said, as my child, your motives matter. Why? Because he understood something. If we do it for the wrong motives, it won't produce in us what it is intended to produce in us. It's the attitude and the spirit of, of him, himself and Jesus Christ. So let's... It I'm plays all the way through his ministry. When you think about that, even the crucifixion, he did it for the motives that the Father gave him, not that he, because that's he right. was going to have to have it removed from him. That, that's right. That's right. So the example is, for uh, the ultimate example would be, would you give your life for anybody in this room? Because mm -hmm. Jesus would. That's right. That, 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 that's right. And that, that's, that's so very true. That those, those motives he demonstrated time and time again. So let's look at a couple of wrong motives uh, that, that, Jesus, that Jesus pointed out here uh, in this text. First of all, he, he said the first wrong motive is spirituality as a show. If you do things to be seen. He pointed this out again and again throughout this text. And three times, as a matter of fact, he, he denotes that people were, were giving that they, were, that they were praying, that they were fasting uh, in ways so that they could be seen. They were giving, oh, big offerings, you know, when, when, every, when the trumpets were sounded so that people could see that, make sure that. They were standing out, on the, they were standing out in, in the streets praying, you know, these great prayers so that they could be seen. They were, when they were fasting, oh, it looked like you'd just been beat up with a baseball bat. They had, you know, oh, what, what, what. they made sure, they made sure everybody understood that they were fasting. It, be, it became a spiritual show. If you're going to do that, don't bother. If it's just to show off, you're, you're, you're negating, Jesus said. Well, he's like, the Father is just going to say, okay, they have the reward. They, you know, they, they, but it's when, and so we need to make sure that spirituality... Now, this speaks especially to people who are involved in ministries that are seen. It's, it's, it's something I have to catch. And it's something that worship leaders have to catch. It's something that Sunday school teachers have to catch. It's have, have to, where there's ministries where you're seen, we have to be sure of that we are not making our spirituality a show in, in the midst of it all. And then there's a, then there's a factor. Uh, uh, well, let, let's, let's, let's just look at one of those. Uh, verse 1. Take heed that you do not do your charitable deeds before men, why? To be seen by them. Otherwise, you have no reward from your Father in heaven. Now, I want you to notice something. He said, otherwise, you have no reward. Even the child of God, even the kingdom personality, even, even somebody who, who, who goes by the right motive most of the time, but today I'm not going to do that. You, know, uh, you, you can be as guilty of this as, as, as anybody, uh, Jesus was saying. But James Stott, and maybe I don't know if you ever heard of him. James Stott uh, 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 gave me uh, gave me a little insight into 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 this that I, that I never noticed before. Never really uh, saw it this way. But it was that one of the wrong motives is spirituality as self praise. He points out that oftentimes we motivate ourselves by how good it feels to do a good thing. That we can pat ourselves on the back because we, we you know, uh, it's kind of it's like the executive that, that, that cheats on his wife, that, that, 
that treats his employees bad, that is underhanded in his business dealings, but because he gave a dollar to a bum on the street, he feels, oh, I am a good guy. You know, that is the same spirit that Jesus is attacking in, one, in, 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 the, in this passage right here. But when you do a charitable deed, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. Jesus was actually suggesting that we keep our good deeds from ourselves. <laughs> that we not let one, one part of us know what the other part is doing. That we give in such a way that it's that, that it, that not something that we, that we promote. That we give in such a way that it's not something that we, that we proclaim to ourselves. That we sit around and pat ourselves on the back about. He said, well, that can be a dangerous thing as well. That can be a dangerous motive as well in, in our life. Is that we need to realize that in our, in our disciplines, we need to guard our hearts against the spirituality as self-praise. You know, uh, we need to be obedient because that's what God says to do. We need to, we need to, we need to do for God because that's what God tells us to do. But if we're not careful, we can find ourselves uh, tangled up, tangled up in it all. And, and and the third wrong motive is superficial spirituality. How is this different from the others, Derek? And that is when we do something simply for the sake of doing it because it's religious or ritualistic. That it, that it is only an act that we do because we profess to be a Christian or we profess to know Christ that we do not allow its impact to absorb into our spirit and soul. That we don't allow it to change us. If your prayer life isn't changing you, it's doing you no good. If fasting doesn't transform you uh, in the process of it, it's not doing what it's intended to do. If even giving doesn't change us, it's not doing what we want it to do. It becomes superficial, superficial spirituality. That's what the, the scribes and the Pharisees were doing. They were doing things for the sake of showing off and for the sake of saying, well, this is what righteous people do instead of allowing God's transforming grace to change you. When the uh, when the when the uh, uh, when when scholars begin to recently dig into this matter and look through the scriptures and, and determine what uh, what changes us, they begin to realize that this is a major part of the transformation. It's not a minor thing. You, know, you will not be changed if you don't pray. You will not be changed if you don't do what God's called you to do. You will not be changed if you don't pattern your life after Jesus Christ. You'll be the same old person with a, with a heart that's been changed, but your life has not, hasn't been changed. We need to embrace this. Now, that leads us to the next, the next thing that we need to realize. God's involvement mattered to Jesus. God's involvement matters to Jesus. One of, the, one of the major distinctions uh, that Jesus talks about when he talks about, talks about these two different things is that God is involved in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the child of the kingdom. God is involved in what is going on. As a matter of fact, the most repeated word in our text is the word father here in, in, the, in, the word, in, in this word. And it is mentioned nine times and it is only used when talking about the children of the kingdom of God. See, the distinction that Jesus made was that the, that the spiritual disciplines that the religious were doing, they were doing on their own. But for the child of God, for the, king, the people following it, the king, as kingdom of God, when they were doing it, God was involved. God was working in that. God was working through that. God was working in, uh, 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 among that, uh, uh, here in the Word of God. They, it was, they realized that it was a partnership with and a partnering with God. You're going to see this throughout the entirety of the teachings of Jesus Christ. Jesus understands something. You cannot live righteously on your own. It's a miracle of God at work in your life. 
You cannot live uh, in, in a life that has, has known the power over sin in your heart without the miraculous work of God in your life. Jesus understood that. Jesus constantly involved in, in, this, in this teaching. He constantly involved the, 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 the terminology of the Father because he, he wants us to understand that very thing in our life. I heard one writer say, um, uh, there's only one Christian that ever walked this planet. His name is Jesus. And if you want to be a Christian, it's going to be because Jesus is walking through you. Because Jesus is living through you. So we need to realize that it is a partnering with God. God's involvement mattered to Jesus and it must matter to us. And then here's, here's one that might surprise you. Methods matter to Jesus. As, as, as Craig pointed out, how we do what we do matters to Jesus. Now, let me, let me make a few things crystal clear to you. I don't want you leaving this place thinking I, I, I said anything different. Please hear me. Method is not the first thing. And it's not the most important thing. But it is a thing <laughs> with Jesus. Jesus saw it as important of not just what we do, why we do it, but he saw it as important as how we do it. In our, that's why he gave us so, so much such descriptive, descriptive uh, methods here in this teaching. Jesus didn't just say, okay, you're on your own, go pray. Jesus said, this is how you do it. Jesus didn't just go, just go ahead and say, uh, 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 go ahead and go fast. Jesus said, this is how, how it's done. Jesus didn't say, just go give. Jesus said, this is how it should be done. Method was important to Jesus, so method should be important to us. But there's a warning here, and I'm, 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 I still want to do that. And that warning is that when method becomes the main thing, it becomes ritual then. When you're doing it basically because that's what you feel like you should do, it becomes ritual in your life and it becomes religious in your life. And it, and, it, and it doesn't hold the power that God truly wants in your life. Jesus did talk to us about methods for a very different way. Jesus shows us, us a better approach. Jesus talks about this kind of, this kind of ritual in, in, uh, in, in this verse here. That's what's in verse 7. And when you pray, do not use vain repetitions. Notice that. As the heathen do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. He said, we need to understand that, that you know, it's not, it's, everything doesn't hinge on how you do it. How you do it is just to, just to focus in on what he considers to be uh, uh, the better practices in our life. But on the, same, on the same sense of that while we're there, I want you to realize that when it comes to methods, that we should never equate routine with ritual. Habits require routine, right? For them to be etched into our heart and our soul, and, and to be and to be what to be what God intends in our life, we should never need, never need. I, I hear people talk about prayer as if they if they have a planned prayer life that it's somehow anti spiritual. I'm like, you really got to twist the scripture to get that. <laughs> you really do. The disciples went to the temple at, at times of prayer. There was, uh, Jesus had, had, had they, they talked about prayer. Prayer was in, involved in, in their life. Uh, routine was a part of their life. Holy habits that God wants us to, to, uh, to establish in our hearts and our life. So never equate routine with ritual. It, it, it becomes ritual when it becomes the only reason you're doing something. Is so that you can tell everybody or so that you can say that you've done something. But you see, uh, uh, what, what God wants us to realize, it's a method is for one major reason. And that is Jesus focuses his methods on best practices. What is the definition of best, best practices? What will produce in you what it was intended to produce in you. If you look at the way Jesus tells us to do this, it protects us from superficial spirituality. If we practice things the way he tells us to practice things, it, it is in such a way that it guards our hearts and it produces in us the nature and the character that Jesus intended for us. Just, let's just take a look at just a couple, just a couple of those things uh, that uh, the little practice, practice, 
practical tips that Jesus gives us. He said, first of all, when you give, give secretly. He said, he said, he said uh, when you pray, pray in secret, close the door, and, and the Father will reward you openly. He says, you need to prioritize your, your prayers. Your prayers need to first focus on God's and the, and, and the needs of your community and the condition of your heart. He said, he, needs to, he, said, he said, let grace impact you. I like, I, like, I like that. Jesus, at the end of this teaching, he says, tells them, after teaching them how to pray, to, to pray for God, for, 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 for me to forgive those. That have, and then he goes into this, this extra verse talking about how if you don't forgive them, the Father won't forgive you. What did that have to do with the prayer? That prayer should change your heart toward others. That prayer should cause you to pray. It's hard to be angry with somebody you're praying for. <laughs> it's hard to hate somebody and not forgive them when you're calling their name before the throne of God. Because that impacts your heart. That impacts your soul. Jesus said that is something that we need to do. And then he said when you fast, fast secretly. Make it so that people don't even know you're fasting. Clean you, you know, yeah, yeah. Wash your hair. <laughs> Take a bath. You know, don't go around, oh, I'm so hungry I can almost die. I've been you know, fasting for Jesus. You know, not, not. He, said, he said, keep it in secret in, 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 your, in your life. Because the, 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 the fact of the matter, and it's, and it's the, yes, our very last point here, is that your destination determines the road you take. As a matter of fact, why we do what we do and why we practice what we practice is determined by what we want Jesus to produce in us. If you want to be like him, there's a path for being like him. If you want to do what he did, there's a path for doing what he did. When we determine our destination, the end results, it will determine. If you want to be religious, put on a show. If you want everybody to think you're super spiritual, go down that road. But Jesus said, that's not the road I've anointed for you. That's not the road that I have for you. You see, your destination will determine the road that you take in your life. You see, God has given us the keys that we might be able to embrace the ways to reach and to get into him. As they learn, this is key in our life. This is not the only spiritual discipline. Worship is a spiritual dis discipline. Uh, 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 you know, purity is a spiritual dis discipline. These are spiritual disciplines that we must commit ourselves to so that the, Holy, the work of the Holy Spirit can do a work in us and around us. Now, there's an old, there's an old saying that I have to say I agree with about 50% of the time. The other 50% of the time I'm like, mm, if, you take, if you look at it from a different vantage point, uh, then, then no, it's not right. And that's the, a bumper sticker phrase, there's power in prayer. Now, do I believe God uses prayer? Absolutely. Do I believe the power is in the prayer? Not at all. To say that is to say that Buddhist prayers are powerful, that Islamic prayers are powerful. Prayer is a tool that without God, is useless. Prayer is a tool. So there's power in praying correctly <laughs> and praying the way and praying to God and praying and trusting God and, and the power in it transforming us with God. But we, that's why I take you back to that point. It is a tool that we need to realize and our goal must be for it to do in us what God wants it to do in us. Not so that we can have a notch on our belt that says, I pray X amount of times, or I've done this, or I've done that. But you say, Lord God, I'm putting myself in a position where you can change my heart and my life. Amen. Amen. Well, we appreciate you com coming out tonight and uh, appreciate your attentiveness. Uh, 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 we are, we're glad that you're here. Hope that the rest of your week will go wonderfully.